Morning San Antonio starts right now. And good morning to you. It is Thursday, February 15th. We're going to get to weather in just a second, but right now we have big problems on Loop 410 at Evers. Let's check in with RJ. All right, guys. Yeah, just got off the phone with Trans Guide right now and uh, getting some more details on this. This was an accident that involved at least uh, four vehicles that you could see off the side of the road here on the uh, right hand side there. This is 410 eastbound at Evers. This is Highway uh, 16, basically Bandera Road that's going over 410 and Evers right here. We have uh, fire officials there. We have emergency trucks on the scene right now. Not too sure exactly uh, any details on any injuries at the moment. Again, this kind of popped up a little while ago there on the uh, northwest side. But again, Loop 410 eastbound at Evers Road right there at uh, Bandera Road. We have a pretty significant wreck here. Now we are seeing traffic come through on the far left hand. You see on the shoulder and at least one of the main lanes, but at least two main lanes blocked here as we have all these vehicles on the side of the uh, shoulder there on the right hand side. Want to let you know what this looks like here on our maps. And again, this is right there where uh, Bandera Road intersects with Loop 410 uh, eastbound against uh, Bandera Road. Now traffic has been backed up all the way uh, to Ingram and then to Calabra actually right now. So a little while ago it was all the way up to Ingram. Now it's all the way up to Calabra Road. So keep that one in mind if you are headed out. Again, 410 eastbound at uh, Bandera Evers Road. Want to let you know about a stalled vehicle, US 90 eastbound and I-35. This one looks uh, like it's not causing too many of a delay right now for our drivers south of downtown, but uh, something to keep in mind if you're headed there. And the southeast side, 37 northbound at Southeast Military, still dealing with a stalled vehicle in that direction, northbound 37 at Southeast Military. Biggest thing we're following at the moment, again, Several lanes blocked here, a multi-vehicle accident here, uh, 410 eastbound at Evers Road, right there at the Bandera sort of uh, intersection. So keep this one in mind if you're about to head out. We will continue to follow the very latest and give you more updates as they become available. But uh, let's check out how things are actually feeling outside. Justin, how are things looking? Uh, it's warm, RJ. You saw the cloud cover. It, you know, we think in February it'd be cold. It's not. We've had some fog to deal with, too. I don't know if that's playing a role in any of the uh, traffic issues this morning, but there has been some thick fog in spots, especially out west. Places like Castroville seeing zero visibility at this moment. Most of San Antonio, though, doing okay. You'll see the uh, airport visibility is okay. Uh, Randolph Stinson. So most of the fog is lifting, but we'll keep an eye on Castroville where there is still a fog issue. Our forecast today. Cloudy skies, noontime 66. I, we could see a few peaks of sun, but I don't expect much. It'll be a lot like yesterday. We make it up to 72, though. It is warm, and you can see the very, very small rain chances there. Those rain chances start to step up as we get into tonight and certainly by tomorrow morning. I think tomorrow morning's commute could be fairly damp with light rain possible. You want to keep that in mind. Maybe allow for a little extra time tomorrow morning for the work and school commute. Saturday. We want to let you know this is going to be very windy. Gusts 30 to 35. Temperatures will be in the 40s and 50s, but that means that means wind chills will be in the 30s and 40s. Uh, so Saturday is going to be a chilly day. Uh, we also have an update on the drought monitor. We do have some improvements to talk about. It is Thursday. It usually comes in on Thursday. So we'll have more on that in just a couple minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, the deadline is today for SAISD families to choose a new school for their children for the 2024-2025 school year. This is for students who currently attend one of the 15 schools set to close at the end of the school year. It's part of the district's right-sizing plan. As of last night, about 700 families still had not made a decision. Hundreds of other families have already made the decision not to return to SAISD next school year. Parents of children at one of the schools closing can either accept their newly designated school or choose a campus of their choice, but a decision must be made today. There's a lot happening in the news department today. Here's today's Night at Nine. One person is dead. At least 21 others were injured after shots were fired at the end of the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Of those injured, eight were children, but they are expected to be okay. However, officials say more than a dozen adults are suffering life-threatening injuries. Police have taken three people into custody, but this morning haven't released more details about the suspects. About a million people were at the parade. Lawmakers are urging Americans to stay calm despite a threat to national security. Members of Congress and the Biden administration are meeting with intelligence and defense officials today to address the, quote, serious national security threat, end quote. Multiple sources say it relates to Russia's space capabilities, specifically a nuclear anti-satellite system. Immigration and Customs Enforcement has drafted plans that could result in thousands of immigrants being released. 
A source familiar with the plans says the contingencies are to help with budget shortfalls. Record levels of migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border have drained federal resources. To stop that, the source says ICE is discussing slashing detention space. Federal regulators are looking into what's behind the generic drug shortages. The Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Health and Human Services are launching an investigation. They plan to look at drug purchasing and wholesale companies to see if they're disrupting the supply chain. They also want to hear from the public and have issued a request for information. People who aren't financially stable are way more likely to use buy now, pay later plans. New research shows people with low credit scores or who were declined credit or fell behind on a loan in the past year are three times more likely to use these short-term installment loans. Consumer advocates have raised concerns noting that a lack of data, transparency, and formal regulations make it difficult to track debt associated with buy now, pay later. New York City is taking the world's top social media companies to court. The city says these companies impose a, quote, large burden on mental health services to youth, end quote. This comes as numerous families have also recently filed lawsuits for the same reason, but taking legal action against social media platforms can be challenging due to a federal law, Section 230, which states tech companies can't be held responsible for what users place on those sites. Some people who purchased Apple's new Vision Pro headsets at the beginning of the month have started to return them. That's because the 14-day return period expires tomorrow. Some complaints include headaches, eye strain, and discomfort. Other customers call the headset a mind-blowing experience and worth the $3,500 price tag. A new study found smoking's effect on the immune system can last years. Researchers found smoking decreases the body's ability to fight off infection immediately. And over time, when smokers in the study quit, their immune response got better at one level, but didn't completely recover for years. When a wave of depression hits, a new study suggests physical activity may help significantly. It states that many types of exercise, like walking, jogging, yoga, and strength training, can be just as beneficial as therapy when it comes to treating depression. It can also serve as an effective treatment when paired with therapy and medication. And that's today's Night at Night. And your other morning headlines, if you want a patent for an invention you came up with, make sure AI was not a part of it. And a lunar lander looking for a spot on the south pole of our moon. Plus doctors on Earth performing surgery in space with a robot. David Sears is here with your morning headlines. Good morning, David. This is like Star Trek stuff. This is like out of this world, literally. We'll have that for you in just a second. But first, let's start with this. Finally found something that AI cannot do. Get a patent for an invention. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office put out some guidelines this week. Pretty simple. Only humans can get a patent for inventions. None of those fake people. To be more specific, a human has to make a significant contribution to the invention looking for a patent. So you come up with a new kind of machine, but a computer or AI came up with the most significant part or came up with the design. No patent since the computer did most of the work. So we're staying old school. It has to be your invention to get a patent. All right, here we go. Another shot of getting a lunar lander on the moon. This rocket is transporting the lander Odyssey. It's the plan for the lunar lander to touch down on the surface later this month. It is operated by a private company in coordination with NASA. Their landing spot will be at the south pole of the moon. So I just want to know if that is a good place for future missions. The Odysseus has a lot of experiments on board for this trip. The company is hoping this trip works out so that that lander can deliver items for manned missions in the future. If the mission is successful, it could be just a first step into much deeper space exploration. The moon has one sixth the gravity of Earth and no atmosphere. So it's a much easier place to launch deeper into the solar system. It really is the launching pad into human exploration out into deep space. Two other missions to the moon failed early this year, so this scientists are hoping the third time is the charm for this one. All right, but there is one successful one going on right now. You're looking at an operating room here on Earth, but the operation is actually taking place in space using the surgical robot. Remember the SpaceX rocket that took off last month? This is one of the experiments the astronauts are performing, or actually doctors on Earth are performing the experiments. Doctors using a robot created by a company called Virtual Incision. The operating room is at their headquarters in Nebraska. After the astronauts powered up the robots, six doctors tried their hands at operating. They are testing their skills using rubber bands to simulate different body parts. First off, they were operating in zero gravity and they had to deal with a second delay. 
the adrenaline was pumping and, you know, I could feel my, my heart pounding. Um, it was, uh, it was really exhilarating, but at the same time, it, it, once I saw that, you know, robotic device doing the things that I'm used to it doing, uh, settled down a split second or, you know, a half a second, uh, is going to be significant. So uh, th this was a big challenge. You can see a left hand with a grasper and a right hand with a pair of scissors. So you could think of those rubber bands as perhaps, you know, blood vessels or tendons or other connective tissue that has elasticity. So we're able to, you know, grab hold of uh, the rubber bands and then take the scissors and just basically to cut them. All right, I'm going for it. One small rubber band, <laughs> but a great leap for surgery. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine having to have perform a surgery for somebody in space and you're doing from Earth with a robotic fingers and arms? That's, that, that is amazing. That's that, absolutely amazing. That's, that's a lot of uh, pressure. I mean, surgery itself um, seems very difficult. But that's some serious skill right there. Yes. When so, science fiction yeah, becomes reality. reality. Yeah, yes. There it is. Thank Getting you, there. David. All right. 909, 62 degrees. Look out there with trans guys. Still problems in a big old holdup right there at Loop 410 at Evers. We were talking about this earlier in the show. We're going to be checking in to see uh, the conditions there in a little bit. This Best of Mutton Busted, powered by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. All right, contestant 15 there was Next Level Pro. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the waving at the crowd. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you do uh, to reassure mom and dad. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell them you're okay. Yeah, we're good. Wave we're your good. hands. <laughs> Some kid yesterday did the Macarena when he stood what? up. It was, it was oh, impressive. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're getting better at their celebrations. I like it. <laughs> Victories, yes. Uh, yes, uh, we're, we're celebrating a bit of a victory in the drop monitor, too. We've seen some improvements since the beginning of the year. As you know, the, the rain's been good. So this is the latest drop monitor that just came in this morning. You'll see that San Antonio is still in a moderate drought. And yes, the Hill Country is still in extreme drought. So this, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. But we've chipped away at it a little bit. Let me take you to the beginning of the year. This is where we started on January 1st. You'll see that a lot of our area was an extreme drought. Now I'll flash back to where we are today. Yeah, we've eaten away at it a little bit. Not completely, but a little bit. And we do have more rain uh, in the forecast. So let me show you the rainfall potential as we head into uh, the next couple of days. This is through Friday night and the very early Saturday morning. The areas that need the rain, not going to get it. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it looks like any sort of rain up here is going to be very, very light. So Kerrville, Bandera, Blanco, not the kind of rain we would hope for. In this case, a lot of heavy rain is going to be off to the south. San Antonio, we're going to be on the edge. But I think we could pick up a tenth, maybe a quarter, maybe up to half an inch in some places in Bear County. As you get down to the south, though, that's where the good rain is, not in the areas that technically need it the most. So one to two inches, Corpus Christi, Laredo, and Catua. Uh, basically the same idea we've been looking at the last couple of days. But as we look at the forecast here, a couple things to point out. This is 4 o'clock today. No rain. I can't count out a shower. Uh, but it's not going to be until later tonight that we start to see these showers beginning to develop and lifting north. This stuff is going to be really light. This is around midnight, uh, maybe a few sprinkles. But I think by tomorrow morning, this is 6 a.m., that's when we could get into maybe a little bit more moderate rain here in San Antonio. That will affect the morning commute. Wet roads, as you're heading off to work this morning, umbrella, grab it, uh, jacket, you may want it. Uh, then these showers will move east by midday. Now there still will be some activity around, but it lightens up a little bit. Even uh, during the afternoon on Friday, maybe just a light shower or two. We bring rain chances down. Then we bring them back up again as the frontal battery moves in late Friday. This is nine o'clock. If you have Friday evening plans, be aware that there is a front that'll be uh, moving in and we'll start to see a little bit more shower development along that front. This is 11 p.m., more activity, and as that front pushes towards the coast, you'll see showers, uh, especially like Goliad, the Quero, over to Pleasanton. By 6 a.m. Saturday, though, I think the rain is tapering off here in San Antonio. So that's kind of how it times out 
Let me break it down for you. Friday morning, 60% chance. Friday afternoon, we bring it down to a 30% chance and then bump it back up. Friday night with the front, the 40% chance and just a very small, small chance early Saturday morning. Right now, we've got 62 outside and cloudy. Dew point is at 59. Still some of that fog lingering, although we started the show off with zero visibility in Castroville. It's gotten better. And so most of the fog is starting to go away. We've still got the clouds, though, and they'll hang around. KSAT 12 hour forecast 66 noontime by 4 o'clock. 72 today, mostly cloudy. And again, just a 10% chance of rain. We will bump that up to a 20% chance by this evening. Extended forecast 65 tomorrow with that 60% chance of rain mainly in the morning. And then again, Friday night into very early Saturday morning. But the main takeaway on Saturday 50 and windy. We'll be in the 40s most of the day. You got gusts 30 to 35 out of the north. That means wind chill values will be in the 30s and 40s. Saturday will be a windy, chilly day. Sunday, it does improve after a near freezing start. 32 Sunday morning, 59 for a high on Sunday. And then turns into spring. We could be near 80 by Wednesday. <laughs> uh, so that's, that is the fun of February right there. I don't know if you, fun. you knew you did this, uh, but the front's not even here yet. Saturday's not even here yet. And you're already kind of <laughs> using the friction of your hands uh, to stay warm. I just feel it. I yeah. just feel it. Uh, you know, that, that wind. Will, it, it, we've had windy weekends, I feel like, yeah, almost right. every yeah. uh, weekend. This will be no exception. Okay, but at least it's you know going to go by quickly, and by Sunday afternoon, it's a little better. Sunday will be beautiful. So if you're picking one day out of the weekend, Sunday is your day. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. 17 past the hour, 62 degrees. We'll be right back. Welcome back. 921. A young mother's battle with a rare blood condition turned into a heartwarming tale of love and sacrifice as her fiance steps forward for a life-saving kidney transplant. Our Max Massey talked with the couple about that life-changing gift. Year and a half. I get emotional. <laughs> this is Natalie Cerna and Royal Johnson, a couple who went through a terrifying experience, which should have been one of the happiest days of their lives. She had a normal pregnancy. Turned into terror. They wasn't able to stop the bleeding. They took her to the OR once they knew that they had to operate on her. Natalie was diagnosed with a rare blood disease. Atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. She was in the hospital for a whole month. It was day after day of working to figure out what exactly happened, and what could be done? They were having her have blood transfusions. They were putting on a bunch of meds, pushing a bunch of meds on her, and that ultimately caused her kidneys to fail. I kind of didn't want to accept the fact that, you know, I was on dialysis and that was going to be my, my life. Then Royal learned he could help out, even though he was not the right blood type. Well, he wasn't my match. So, and that's another thing that I was like, okay, like, are you sure you want to do it? Um, because he would be giving it to somebody else. So the transplant has an exchange program, which is an awesome exchange program. The pair went through the kidney exchange program at Methodist Transplant Institute. That's where living donor kidneys, well, they're exchanged with other recipients in need to ensure each patient receives a compatible transplant. You do whatever it, you know, it takes for you to protect your family. So I was like, this is the easiest decision of my life, you know, especially seeing her every night, having to hook herself up to dialysis and, you know, the emotional uh, trauma that she was going through. Now, about two years later, Natalie wants to know other people who are going through exactly what she did. She wants them to know they're not alone and that there are programs like the kidney exchange to help out. As for Royal, he could not be happier with his decision. One of the best decisions I ever made and don't regret it at all. And the couple, well, they're eager for the next step. Next is uh, the big day, the, the, you know, the wedding day. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Have you ever heard of the Keyhole Club? It's just west of downtown and it was the first integrated nightclub here in San Antonio. Well, digital journalist Mason Hickok sits down with a historian to talk about the Keyhole Club's beginnings in the 1950s. It hasn't been gentrified, and it looks very much the way it did when it originally opened, which I think is beautiful. A teal building off West Poplar Street might not look like much, but it's seen its share of history. Known today as the home of the Cruz Blanca Sociedad Fraternal, the building was known as the Keyhole Club one of San Antonio's first racially integrated nightclubs. The club's owner, Don Albert, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1908. Music brought Albert to the Alamo City. Lending time as a trumpeteer in several house bands, he turned to managing nightclubs in late 1944 and opened the first version of the keyhole on the east side at the corner of Iowa and Pine Street. 
Due to the venue's location not far from Fort Sam Houston, the crowds at the keyhole were an example of integration. My impression is this, that Don Albert would welcome anybody who came through the door. In April 1950, he moved the club to the west side, where the building still stands today. Raids by the San Antonio police and Commissioner George M. Roper stalled operations despite the club's success. In 1951, the keyhole was taken to court for a defective roof. But the whole effort was to attempt to destroy the business. While Albert and his business partner celebrated winning their case, operations at the club began to slow, due in part to more integrated nightclubs, and the rise of the television. Albert closed the doors of the keyhole in the mid-1960s. Today, the building still exists as a gathering space for the local community. Soon, the building will bear a historical marker, signifying a history integral to the community even after the music has stopped. Mason Hickok, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Mason. 925, uh, there's still much more ahead on GMSA at 9. That's right, we're gonna go ahead and check in with Justin again after the report about his forecast. Plus, Lee Waldman is going to be joining us to talk about her latest case that investigates peace. She broke down the 10 opportunities missed by law enforcement that should have stopped the killings at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. She's going to talk more about what she discovered in the DOJ report. And let's look out there with Transguide. RJ is tracking this major crash. This is Loop 410 eastbound. We're going to check in with him after the break. All right, sit 929 right now. Welcome back as we take you outside Transguide traffic cameras. Take a look here at the latest here with this major crash on the northwest side. We're looking at Loop 410 eastbound at Evers Road. So we've had fire officials there for some time. We also had a, a, an ambulance there at the scene earlier after at least three vehicles crashed here on the eastbound lanes of Loop 410 at Evers Road. So the highway you see above here is Bandera Road. This is that intersection there that is always very busy there, Loop 410 at Evers. We have another shot here from one of our cameras that's uh, behind the crash here. And again, this is eastbound traffic. You could see that traffic has been building up all the way past uh, Ingram Park Mall. And that's actually what we're going to show you real quick here on our maps. Loop 410 eastbound at Bandera Road. You could see this is causing at least a 25 minute delay. So it's going to take you about 25 minutes to get from Culebra all the way up to Bandera Road. It's a three mile stretch. So it is a pretty significant delay out there for our drivers on the northwest side. So one more quick look here. Multi vehicle accident there. 410 eastbound at Evers Road. Be take caution if you're headed to this area because there are some pretty significant delays out there. Mark and Stephanie, back to you guys. Thank you, Justin. Let's look out there with live cam. Not as cold as it was yesterday, but a little dreary looking for now. Yeah, it is. Uh, we still have some fog in spots, although that's lifting. The clouds are going to stay with us most of today, so don't expect much sun at all. I want to show you a picture on our case at Connect. Let's go back to 2021. We all remember it. Uh, some bad memories, maybe some good memories, too. This was a snowman. Uh, well done. Yvonne sent this in from back in 2021 and it was on this day three years ago where we were tabulating the snowfall at this point where we picked up 3.7 inches of snow uh, here in San Antonio 5.2 in Sisterdale 4.4 uh, 4 even there in New Braunfels an inch in Seguin so uh, it was a lot of snow most since uh, we've seen in you know the 85 storm so it was a lot and uh, obviously it caused some issues. We were still in store for more snow down the line too. That's what was incredible, but that was three years ago, up to six inches of snow across parts of San Antonio. Hard to believe. No snow today, noontime, 66, cloudy skies. We'll see a few peaks of sun and then up into the low seventies for highs. Stays humid and warm today. And then we start to bring the rain chances up tonight. And especially as we get into tomorrow morning, it will be a wet commute. 60% chance of light rain here in San Antonio. Lower chances by Friday afternoon, pick it back up a little bit Friday night with a cold front and then the rain clears out by early, early Saturday morning, but it turns windy and cold. Another look at that weekend forecast for you in just a couple minutes. Justin, thank you. Earlier this week, we aired the latest case out investigates piece about the 10 opportunities missed by law enforcement that should have stopped the deadly shooting at Rob Elementary in Uvalde. Our Lee Wallman went through the entire DOJ report on the shooting and tons of video from that day. And she joins us now to talk more about what she discovered. Thank you for being with us, Lee. Thanks for having me. Lee, we understand that going through this DOJ report that there were 10, 10 missed opportunities where responding officers could have stopped the gunman there at Rob Elementary. 
Yeah, could have and should have. So this DOJ report outlined all of it. The report lays out those 10 moments in chronological order, starting with the initial response when the first Uvalde PD and Uvalde CISD officers arrived at the school. The report pointed to those key moments, multiple rounds of gunfire while officers were there. The first just minutes after they arrived, 911 calls coming in from children trapped inside of classroom 112. And then UCISD police chief, Pete Arredondo waiting for master keys while other classrooms were evacuated. Now, two moments that stuck out to us in particular were with Ruben Ruiz. He's the husband of teacher Eva Morales. Twice, 20 minutes apart, he said the classroom was his wife's, and he also told those officers in the hallway with him that she had been shot. The body camera video shows that acting UPD chief Mariana Vargas led Ruiz out of the hallway, and it took almost an hour from that moment for officers to then breach that classroom and stop the killing. And we know from that report that Eva was then pulled out of that classroom alive, and she was treated medically on a sidewalk before she later passed. And again, Ruben was led away from that scene there. Very hard to watch. And speaking of that, you went through all the video. This includes all the surveillance video, all the body camera video. So before putting this together, we understand that you talked to the families of the victims. Well, we understand that this isn't our story. This is their story still at the end of the day. So it was important that we as a station, we wanted to air the sounds of these gunshots because they were mentioned over and over again in that DOJ report, specifically pointing to the fact that the gunman was still shooting while hundreds of officers were at that school. But we also didn't want to be insensitive. So we put the question to families and asked if they would be okay with us airing the sounds of that gunfire. And uh, none of them had said no. They just, they said that it's important for people to hear what happened that day, what their loved ones had gone through. And even after this story aired, we had people reaching out to us and asking if we could send the story to them so that they could watch. As heart-wrenching, as heartbreaking as what happened on May 24th was, it's the reality of what those children and those teachers face. They were trapped inside of a classroom, begging, pleading for help, while hundreds of officers from nearly two dozen agencies were waiting on the other side of the classroom door, and it took 77 minutes for the rescue to finally come in and stop the horror of what they were going through. And Lee, that brings us to today. We've been talking about the shootings that plagued the country yesterday. More people experiencing the worst day of their lives. We have to imagine this is taking a toll on the Uvalde victims' families. The victims, the survivors, every single time one of these headlines comes out, it's heart-wrenching, and it brings them back to what happened on May 24th, 2022. Yesterday, another dark day. You mentioned a shooting at a Super Bowl parade meant for celebration, officers shot in Washington, D.C., and a shooting at a school in Atlanta. Now, these tragedies, they just keep on happening. So the families in Uvalde who have become advocates fighting for gun legislative changes, I spoke with them yesterday. Brett Cross, Uzziah Garcia's gar guardian, he talked about what happened in Kansas City, and he told us about a new initiative they're starting. It's called the Shot Line, where an A AI will regenerate the voices of their loved ones who were killed to call elected leaders and push for gun reform legislation. We're going to have that story for you later on today. All right, Lee, thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, speaking of that shooting to Kansas City, now the site of the latest shooting in America at the end of yesterday's Super Bowl parade. That's right. Today, the country awaits more details on the victims, the suspects, and why this happened. You're seen as Mike Valerio in Kansas City with the very latest. Well, good morning from outside Union Station, and at this early hour, there is still no word from police on exactly who did this and why. And as we look around us a couple of yards away in the background, you can still see the debris of this interrupted moment, interrupted lives, the stage in the background, that black stage just beyond the road close sign where all the players from the Chiefs were gathered before this happened. What we witnessed yesterday, a terrible coda to this Super Bowl rally. A celebration turned into a tragedy. At least 20 people were shot when gunfire rang out at the end of the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory rally on Wednesday. Everybody started jumping the um, rails and pushing everybody over. We got inside and we thought that, OK, it's calm now. And about that time, people started running again. Paul Contreras and his daughter Alyssa were among the estimated one million revelers gathered at the rally. It all happened so fast. Everybody was kind of dispersing and going back to their cars. Probably a minute or so later, and you just hear pop, 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 pop. As the chaos and confusion began to erupt around them, Contreras heard people shouting for help as a man ran by them. He got close to me. I got the right angle on him, and I hit him from behind, 
And when I hit him from behind, I either jarred the gun out of his hand or out of his sleeve. Because as I'm taking him down to the ground, I see the gun on the ground. It's unclear if that man was one of the three people detained by police. Guns were found at the scene, but many questions remain unanswered. We do not have a motive, um, but we are asking those who may potentially have any kind of information, a witness or video to contact police. And the one person who has lost her life in this attack, her name is Lisa Lopez Galvin. She was a DJ at a local radio station, 90.1 FM, described as a beloved voice of the Latino community here in Kansas City. Relatives also tell us that several of her family members were at the parade at the celebration around her and also wounded in this attack. That's the latest reporting here from Kansas City, Missouri. I'm Mike Valerio. Back to you. More on our newscast later today, of course, on World News Tonight with David Muir. Right now it is 938 on your Thursday morning. It's 941 right now and things aren't warming up as, you know, much as yesterday afternoon, well, at least with the sunshine. Yeah, we're not going to see the, we saw a little bit of sun yesterday. We're going to see probably even less today. A lot of cloud cover. Temperatures will be in the 70s, not bad, but it's going to get chilly by this weekend. That's for sure. So let's go back outside for you. And uh, we've got the cloud cover over the airport and kind of see the low hanging clouds. We've had a little bit of fog here and there, but uh, so far, uh, no big problems here in San Antonio. We're at 62, 63 in New Braunfels, still seeing some upper 50s in places like Bernie in Kerrville. Well, let's look at the visible satellite picture and this shows us all the clouds. Like yesterday, not only do we have the low clouds, we have those thick high clouds too. So it's multiple levels. That's going to make it hard for the sun to shine through this afternoon. I'm not saying it won't. There could be a few peaks here and there, uh, but nothing significant as far as sunshine goes today. 59 Kerrville, 59 Hondo, 63 right now in Kennedy. We've got low 60s around Bear County with cloudy skies. Here's our forecast today, 65 at 11 o'clock, 66 noontime, uh, 72 later today. So fairly warm for a February day with southeast Julie winds 5 to 10. Then we start to add in some rain chances tonight, and those rain chances will pick up even more so by tomorrow morning. Uh, and so that can mean a wet commute on your Friday. Uh, 4 p.m. today, not a lot out there, but watch what, hap what happens as we get into tonight. This is midnight. Showers start to increase south to north. And this is mostly going to be really light, uh, but it may pick up some as we get into the early morning hours on Friday. So this is 6 a.m. sowing some showers, maybe a little bit more moderate rain even here around San Antonio. And uh, that'll quickly move east by midday. We'll see a break in the action, I think, tomorrow afternoon. And then as a front comes through Friday night, we'll pick up the rain chances just a little bit. Uh, some more showers develop right along that boundary. This front, by the way, moves through probably sometime around midnight on Friday, uh, pushing the rain with it down to the south. We're still going to see some showers though very early on Saturday, and then it will clear out some. The clouds won't, but the rain will. So rain chance is 60% Friday morning, 30% Friday afternoon. We pick it back up a little bit Friday night, 40%. And then early Saturday morning, 20% chance of rain. What's going to happen Friday night, though, as that front comes through, it will turn windy and colder. Rainfall potential, not much across the hill country. In fact, if you're in Fredericksburg or Rock Springs, you may not see anything at all. Here in San Antonio, we'll be right on the dividing line between really, really light rain and more significant rain as you get down towards Pleasanton, Carn City, and Pearsall, where they could pick up half an inch, maybe up to an inch in places like Catula, Victoria, and down to Corpus Christi. So a lot of the heavier rain, as we've been talking about, is going to be across deep south Texas. Now, if you're planning out your weekend, we mentioned that front turns windy on Saturday. Wind chill values most of the day on Saturday will be in the 30s and 40s. We'll reach a high right around 50. So Saturday is going to be kind of a blustery, chilly day. 59, though, on Sunday after starting off near freezing. Sunday is definitely the better day of the two. If you're planning out your weekend, maybe you're going to the rodeo. Sunday may be the day to do it. Uh, 59 Sunday, as we said, 70 on Monday, 76 Tuesday. It gets warm as we get into next week, but our main focus will be uh, tonight into tomorrow with those light rain showers, and we'll have updates throughout the day and into tomorrow, especially on the KSAT weather app. Thank you, Justin. I want to get you updated right now. Looks like this incident at eastbound 410 at Evers near Bandera is starting to clear. Originally, there were two lanes and a shoulder blocked. We've been watching that since we went on the air at 9 o'clock this morning. 
Well, our San Antonio Spurs are officially at the All-Star break after another loss to the Mavericks. Spurs held their own in the first half, but Dallas pulled away in the second. David is back with RJ to break things down. Sounds like a broken record. Yeah. Well, my first observation <laughs> is this is no longer like halfway through the season. I mean, the season. Yeah, is like, I, they've pushed is like out the All-Star break. <laughs> So it's like, okay, well, that's that's a little ridiculous. And number two, here, here's my other observation: the Spurs need a break. They need they need Ooh, a rest. Man. It's been a rough season. Yeah. They're 11 and 44. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Ooh. Last year, David, they were 14 and 41 at this point, mm -hmm. and uh, they won 22 games. So yep. that at the time, uh, one of the lowest in franchise history, and it appears we may be on that track again. But at least we have Wemby. Hey, the good news is they were up 15 in the first quarter. The bad news is they couldn't hold the lead, and Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic just mm -hmm. took over down the stretch and, and ended up with another blowout. Here's my problem with this whole thing, is the NBA ruined the All-Star game oh, years boy. ago when they started letting the players draft and all that kind of stuff, and that, that just became a joke. And now they're trying to get back to normal, yes. whatever that is. West. I mean, all these All-Star games, football, NBA, mm -hmm. you know, I don't watch much hockey, so I can tell you how. But this like, how does Victor Wimbanyama, I know the West is stacked. You yep. keep telling me the West is stacked, but how does he not make the NBA? NBA All-Star game. I mean, the guy is leading the league in block shots. Yep. He's got 3.2 yep. block shots a game. Mm -hmm. That's by far and away the best average in the league. He's also averaging a double-double, mm -hmm. 10, 10 rebounds and 20 points a game. How is he not in well, the NBA All-Star game? I, I will say this, David, because, uh, yeah, the, the, and the big man is kind of back in the West. I mean, uh, Nikola Jokic, uh, Sabonis with Sacramento, there's Carl Anthony Towns. There's a lot of good players in the Western Conference, but I do believe this will be the last year that we do not see Victor Wemanyama in would hope. the All-Star game because he has been absolutely incredible. You mentioned some of the stats there. He had that historic triple-double the other night. And you know what? This team goes as Wemby goes, but as the season continues, you see him getting just a lot more comfortable, his skill set. And, uh, David, I, I mean, once he cooled off yesterday, the rest of the team just yeah, kind of fell apart. I mean, fell it was apart. over after that. They were so. looking for the All-Star yeah. weekend. But, but here's the other thing that, that, that kind of bothers you about this whole All-Star thing is the fact that remember when he was coming out of France and mm -hmm. all the attention, this guy's the greatest player to ever, yeah, ever play the game, thing. blah, blah, yeah. blah. The Spurs get the number one pick, blah, blah, blah. All this attention on this guy. Mm -hmm. All these people show up for the press conference when he comes to San Antonio. All these people from all over the world, media from all over the world, well, media from all over the state of Texas, media from all over the country. Where are they now? Well, I mean, the guy's like showing what he can do yeah, just because yeah. his team is not very good. I mean, and, I, and I'm going to promote him to the best player on the Spurs. Mm -hmm. He took over oh, for Devin. Okay. Okay. So it's there we go. Right. So he's officially the best player on the Spurs. But why yeah. is he not in the I – don't, I don't get well, it. Well, he just will such be a there this joke. weekend uh, for the so Rising what? Stars Challenge. No big deal. Along with uh, one of his teammates That's there, Jeremy great, Sohan. So yeah, they're going to take part. He should be an All-Star game. He'll also be there for the skills <sighs> competition. David, some good stuff here. Yeah, no, this stuff. This is fun. Third player in NBA history to reach 1,000 points and 150 blocks in the first 50 games of his career. And he's yeah. not in the All-Star game. Not in the All-Star. Third player in NBA history. Okay, yeah, I kind of made your point there. The Admiral was one and Shaquille O'Neal the other one. Yeah. So Victor Wimbanyama is now the third player in the All -Star and game. second nice. spur to score 1,000 points in his first 50 games behind. Uh, David Robinson. And he's not in the all I keep, I keep there, saying that. Yes. I'm going to keep repeating he that. He will be. He will be. But uh, yeah, not the team has year. definitely struggled this year. It's been a, it's been a rough go. But uh, you know what? Again, we got Wemby. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know what? The other, the other amazing thing is about, <laughs> gonna be about Wemby. One more, one more stat is oh. he, he averages less than 30 minutes a game. Yeah, he's doing all this in good. less than 30 minutes yeah. a game. Mm -hmm. All these stats. And it's just, he should be in the All Star game. Okay. Yeah. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> they blew it. We agree. Thank you. Go Spurs go. Go Spurs go. We'll be back go. in about a minute. I don't know who decided this, but it wasn't a good decision. Aww. Next time, David. All right. Thank you. Next, next no, time. no, next, next year. Next year. Next year. And then many years after that. There's always next year and the year after that. You're right, guys. Thank you. <laughs> about 10 till 63 degrees. Well, a new superhero movie starring Dakota Johnson swinging into theaters tomorrow. We're going to have a preview of Madam Web after the break. And it's always a great day to go to the San Antonio Zoo, and today is World Hippo Day. Aww. Let's see. Bottom left, hide. Oh, yeah, I kind of see in the shade. Is that, is that Timothy or Uma? And Uma. Aww. So the day brings awareness to these vulnerable animals, which are the third largest land mammal in the world.
All right, let's take a look out there with Transguide. We've been talking about the accident earlier this morning, but it looks like things are starting to clear here at Loop 410 at Evers. This is uh, eastbound, uh, close to Bandera Road, or you can see that fly over there, but things are looking a little better in this area. Should be back to normal very soon. Well, Dakota Johnson stars a new superhero flick heading to theaters tomorrow. CNN's Rick Donagelli gives us a sneak peek into Madam Web. Come on, get your stuff. Let's go. Dakota Johnson takes on a very Spider-Man-like baddie in Madam Web. I don't understand what's happening. I've been having visions. Cassie is a young woman whose superpower is her mind. So it's a more cerebral, psychological thriller than it is like a physically action-packed film. This is an emergency. Get off the train. That man's trying to kill you. What? Who are you? What is going on? Johnson's character leads a group of young women during the film, as the actress did off screen. It was totally life imitating art. Um, it, yeah, we absolutely came together as a team. And then there was also this dynamic of like us being silly and having fun and Dakota kind of being the bigger sister on set. Dakota's got so much experience on a film set and, you know, comes from a dynasty of, it, of that. So, you know, she sort of knows her way around a film set and leads from the front. You don't think this is weird, how we're all connected? It's also very different from any superhero film that you've seen. It's very grounded. It's a thriller. It takes you on a wild ride of four females trying to figure out who they are. And they become really close and bonded and find their inner strength. Your future was almost so different. If you want to live, you have to trust me. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. All right, Saturday may be a good day for a movie. It's still going to be mostly cloudy and windy. If you're planning out your weekend right now, know that Saturday uh, we're going to struggle to get out of the 40s, and we're going to see some very windy conditions, so wind chill values will be in the 30s and 40s. Uh, Sunday is the better day. Yes, it'll be cold in the morning, but by the afternoon it'll be sunny and very nice. In the meantime, know that we'll have some showers developing tonight into tomorrow morning. It will be a wet Friday morning commute, about a 60% chance of some light rain, mainly early in the day. Then we'll see some more showers with that front Friday night, and that brings on the cooler weather this weekend. Uh, next week, though, I know a lot of kids have President's Day off. Looks good there, 70 degrees, and then it warms up to near 80 by Wednesday. Thank you, Justin. Hey, we want to let you know for about an hour now, we've been monitoring some police activity in the medical center in the area of Fredericksburg and Blue Mill. Yes, we've had uh, police over there. We also have FBI searching in the Blue Mill area. This, they're looking at in the back of some apartment complexes there. That's right, we have a crew on the scene. We have another one on the way. Look for push alerts on the KSAT app and we'll break in as necessary. Thanks for joining us.